Hello, it's part four of Open Dog version two. First of all, I've put the whole thing on a stand and it's rather satisfying to be able to pick the whole thing up, which I can do quite easily. The weight of this, just without the electronics at the moment, is about 14 and a half kilograms. And we put the mechanical assembly together in the last video. So don't forget to check that out, as well as the one before where we built a single test leg to work out how much load we could put on the top. And that's how we drew the conclusion that this is probably going to work okay. And it's definitely fast enough as well. Today we're going to put the electronics in and hopefully power it up. And this stand is just made of 2020 extrusion and some 3D prints. And I've got these little stirrups here so the feet can rest on there because otherwise they want to fall into the middle because of the mass distribution. So that'll help me when I power up the legs to do the initial calibration. And it looks nice sat on its stand without the legs flopping in and touching each other in the middle. So we're going to be using the O-Drive to control all these brushless motors and we're going to be using six of them in fact. But we need to mount those somewhere in the chassis. There's plenty of space in the middle right now. So we're going to try it and put them in there but we need to make a mounting rig for three at each end of the dog. And that looks like a thing that clips onto the rails that we've got here and sits right down in the middle of the dog. And there's plenty of clearance there for plenty of things. So that can be just lifted straight out and it's gonna be zip tied in using some zip ties around these channels. And we've got the three O drives in there and I'm just basically squeezing the corner of those boards in a 3D printed rig that's going to drop in and that should give us easy access and easy access to all of the connectors. So here are my parts to mount those O drives and what we've got here is six O drives. These are the ones out of the original Open Dog project. So these are actually O drive 3.5s, they're not the 3.6 which is the latest version, but they're rated up to 48 volts and we'll put the latest firmware on. So that should be more than good enough. So here are my three O drives and those are just mounted by putting them into slots which should hold them pretty well. So we'll just put the top back on. And then of course we screw the sides on, which have got the ears and hold the top and bottom and that should drop into the dog. So that should drop straight in there, which seems to work pretty well. And there's plenty of clearance on the middle. We've also got a voltmeter here, which is just a panel meter and that'll carry two bits of studding for power distribution. The O drives are actually capable of reporting the bus voltage. So eventually we'll build a fancy controller that reports it digitally. But for starters, I want to keep an eye on the battery voltage. At the back, of course, we've got another three O drives because we need six in total. Each O drive controls two motors and there's 12 motors, which is three in each of the four legs. We've also got an emergency stop button and that's just going to reset all the O drives. So it takes the reset pin to ground. And that'll immediately cut the motors if there's any problems. But of course, we're going to need a microcontroller to control all of this, to read all those encoders and drive all those O drives. It's going to be very similar to what we did in the previous dogs to start with. But before I tell you about about that, it's just a quick ad for the component sponsor for this video, and that is Cool Components. Cool Components stock Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Microbit, and many, many other electronic and project parts. They're a reseller for Adafruit, SparkFun Electronics, and TeenC, so you can get all those microcontrollers and associated modules from your projects from them, such as shields, hats, soundboards, and displays. Cool Components also stock a range of robot arms and accessories, and lots of other components like switches, LEDs, cameras, and connectors. So you may remember that I filmed the last part of my Sonic the Hedgehog robot series in Cool Components Warehouse, we had it going over jumps and stuff and whizzing around really fast. So I'm really hoping that after lockdown, I'll be able to do some more projects with Core Components. And there's a couple of things that I've built in the last couple of months that I really need a bigger space to test in. So Core Components have actually provided the microcontroller and associated items for this project, which is a TeenC 4.1 this time, as well as some Adafruit Perma Proto and an MPU 6050 inertial measurement unit. So here is the TNC 4.1 and here is a 3.6 which I used in lots of previous projects. They're actually both the same physical size and they appear to have the same pinouts all over them. The 4.1 though is much quicker. This is an ARM Cortex M7 at 600 megahertz. The previous one was only 180 megahertz, which is really faster than I need anyway, but this one has some more advantages. So it's a bit easier if we look at the info cards that they come with, that's the 3.6. And as I say, the 4.1 is exactly the same form factor. The one thing you'll notice though is that the pins are much more accessible on the 4.1. On the back of the 3.6, there were still some pads to get to things like the six serial port, but the 4.1, everything is accessible through the normal pins that you can through hole solder. The 4.1 also has eight serial ports, which is two more than the 3.6, and that doesn't include the USB programming port that you can use for serial debug. So you get eight actual serial ports and you can still debug the data. I'm gonna be using six O drives and each one these a serial port. So that still leaves me two for other peripherals. It also has 100 meg ethernet and USB 
be host on it and there are adapters available for that. So this is pretty fully featured and it's probably gonna be my go-to microcontroller for a lot of projects. The Teensy is just a microcontroller and we can program it as an Arduino, but it does just give us that basic hardware functionality. So I can program the kinematic model, read the encoders and control the O drives and hopefully get this up and walking. At some point we could upgrade to something else with an operating system, perhaps the Jetson Nano that I've got here. And I've been looking at that separately and I'll be looking at it in parallel to perhaps put ROS on the robot. But we could at least use this with one of the deep learning models that NVIDIA have prepared so that we can do vision recognition and navigation and things like that. That. But for now we're going to stick with the Teensy. I am sticking with the serial comms to the O drives. The O drive does support CAN bus, at least the pins are there, but it's not in the production firmware at the moment. It's in development and apparently it works. But for now we're going to stick to the serial bus. We can actually increase the serial speed up to a megabit on each O drive and run all six in parallel, which would be faster than a one meg CAN bus anyway. So probably that's not going to make too much difference apart from a lot more wires. So I've mounted the TNC 4.1 and the Adafruit MPU6050 on some Perma Proto board and I've put those both on socket strips so that I can pull them out. If I break one I can change them easily without having to resolder all the connections or I can repurpose them in another project perhaps one day. And this is mounted in a tray with another space for a half size or full size Perma Proto and some space for other stuff so there's plenty of prototyping space and I've got a 25 way D range connector on each end, one male and one female so they can't be confused and that's how we're going to run the wires out to the rest of the robot. Now you'll notice this is a rather flat tray, it doesn't appear to have a space in the robot but the clue is what's on the bottom. Yep, it's a bit unsightly and it kind of breaks the contour of the robot, but it is there and it's really good for prototyping and making sure these electronics are really accessible. I can get to the USB programming port really easily and all of the things that I'm gonna need as I do development. And yes, we've still got to fit the 12 encoders, which are the AS5047 development boards. And we looked at those in part two when we did the leg testing. They're magnetic encoders. So we've got a magnet fitted on every joint there, which should rotate with the motors. And then that fits face on there. And we've got a special 3D printed plate, in fact, to mount that on. And we need to wire those in and fit them all over the robot as well. So I've wired in all 12 encoders with these cables here that all run and they're strain relieved at both ends. And those run into the O-Drive cages there. And the O-Drive uses that encoder to both position the motor stator to power the motor phases correctly and to position the motor. I've wired in all the motor power cables to the O drives as well and I've now got a LiPo on a long lead which I'm connecting to each O drive individually. I've got a USB lead to my laptop and I'm using the O drive tool to set the calibration there to set the encoder counts per revolution, the motor pole pairs and I've also set the brake resistance to zero. I actually used a brake resistor in the testing in part two but in this one we're going to use regen braking and see how that works out for us. If it doesn't work well for holding power we'll put all the brake resistors on but I'm pretty sure that should be fine. And then we can test every motor, power them up, check all the encoders work and check that we've got holding power on every motor. So the wires are just zip tied up here, the power and the encoder wires. We've got little strain relief plates at this end and they're zip tied onto the chassis here. So we can still get this out in one piece so that we can get to all the O drives and everything. But pretty much that means the leg can flex all the way around and there's no problems with those cables getting pulled. It'd be quite nice to put them in conduit eventually, but that's quite a lot of hassle and we can get split conduit just to put over the cable and make some sort of proper clamp to attach to these rails for the other end. So back with the electronics again, we've now actually taken out that other proto board and I've put in a battery with its own little voltage monitor and a five volt regulator. It's an adjustable one set to five volts at least. And that's powering the TNC and the MPU6050 and anything else we put in here with a stable five volts. And that's really important so that we don't get any nasty transients from the main battery that's powering the motors and all our electronics are really happy, particularly the MPU6050, which seems to get affected by a dirty power supply. I've also wired in all the serial wires here for all of the six serial ports, or at least the six out of eight, and those go to the connectors along with a common ground wire. So we're going to ground that to the battery ground which goes to the O drives and that's common ground throughout the system. And that means that we don't get any ground loops by running additional ground wires with all of the serial lines. 
I've wired in serial wires, which are just bits of wire now for the RX and TX of all of the six O drives, and those wire into each end to go to my Teensy. I still haven't wired in that common ground wire, that needs to go to the battery ground, but that means powering up all the O drives and putting the battery in. And that looks like a six cell LiPo, which is going to fit in this tray, and that again has these gaps for the rails. And that is going to fit right under the front of the dog, we're just having one battery for now, but it's going to zip tie onto those rails. So we're going to use the power distribution thing to distribute the power off to six O drives. So this has got two bits of studding on. Obviously we could do with a cover on that on both sides to stop any shorts, but it's buried right in the dog, so I don't think there's going to be any problems initially. That's got the power meter on there, 23.2 volts. And of course we can put more eyelets on with a nut on top to run those wires out to each of the six O drives. So we've got power distribution in, we've got our nice display there displaying the main battery voltage and the one for the other electronics battery which is also powered up there. And we've got power going into all the O drives and all the motor wires wired in and all the serial wires wired in. So that means we can now go and power up those motors and see if it can stand on its legs. So let's talk about the encoders and the O drives and powering up these motors. So we've got magnetic encoders which are the AMS AS5047s. We looked at those in part two, and those have several interfaces on. So by default, the O drive will use an AB phase quadrature encoder, which means we've got two phases that rise and fall, and we can look at those and decide which way the motor's turning and how far it's turned. And the O drive uses that for both position control, velocity control, and it also uses it to align the motor stator so that it can work out where the motor is and which phases to energize because it's a three phase motor. So those have to be energized in the right order to push the motor around and it uses the encoder to work out where the motor is. So there's a calibration routine you run and when you power up the motor it turns it one way and the other way. And it works out the difference between the encoder position and the motor stator position and that allows the O drive to control the motor properly. Now you can go on further than that to use the Z index pulse, which is another interface essentially that gives you one pulse per revolution, and you can automatically calibrate that, save the settings in the O drive, so when you power up the next time, you don't have to do that test, it already knows what the offset is. So for now I'm not using that, I'm just putting the legs straight, and that makes the default zero position. I will go on to calibrate the Z index, and then we'll know what that offset is, and that will give us a quicker power up in the future. We also have another interface on these encoders, which is the SPI interface, and that gives us absolute position. So there is development firmware for the O drive, it's not in production yet, but that will allow us to just immediately power up the motor by looking at that absolute position encoder, and at some point that will come into production and I'll put that into the robot. But for now we're doing the calibration on every power up, we will eventually do the Z index to save those offsets, and then we'll get the leg to a position, and then we can move it a number of encoder accounts to the known home position where I actually want it, but for now we're just doing that calibration on every power up. So let's power it up and see if it can stand on its legs. Right, the motors are powered up and I've moved those to some fixed positions. So we've got a good stance there and we've got that compression in the leg to give it compliance. So let's try dropping it on the ground. Well, that seems pretty good actually. We've got some uh, natural compliance in the legs there and I have tuned up those O drives to try and give us the best motor performance we can. There's quite a lot of parameters that can be tuned in terms of the gains to hold those motors in position. It's a little bit wobbly. Maybe we could have done with a higher gear ratio all over, but on the whole, I'm pretty happy with that so far. Well, it seems to have enough power and agility there. It'll probably be at a prong, which is jumping along on all four legs at the same time. And hopefully that means that I can get it to put the motors in the right positions where I want them for walking, which is one of the problems I had with Mini Dog 2, where the motors just weren't fast enough. And I think we've definitely got enough power there. Yeah, so those knee motors are getting a bit warm and I always knew it was gonna take more load in the knees, but uh, hopefully that'll be okay. It probably won't melt through the PLA, but if it does, we'll have to put another material really there where the motor mount is, even a piece of aluminium. The others don't seem to be too bad actually. And the ones that move it sideways have hardly any load on them, so those should probably be fine. Obviously there is a bit of flex in it and that natural compliance, we can tune up the O-drive is a bit better. Perhaps we could have done with a higher gearing ratio. We've only got that five to one, of course, but none of the belts seem to slip, so that seems to be all right, really. But nothing is set in stone or plastic. Of course, we can come along and make modifications to this by putting bigger pulleys in and so on, just for the cost of another 3D print. But for now, actually, I think it's probably gonna be okay. If it can jump along, it probably stands to reason that it can walk okay. 
even if it is a little bit wobbly, but this is going to perform much better than anything that I've built before, so we're going to carry on with it as it is for now, see what we can get out of it, and then we can keep doing R&D, we can keep building versions and making modifications and so on and so forth. But I think having these brushes motors really gives it the agility, so this is a really good approach with that really low ratio, which gives us the back drive ability for compliance and of course the speed and power. So next time we're going to build a remote, or at least use the remote that I've got and put a radio receiver in it, so then we can program the kinematic model and then we can hopefully get some things out of it and get it to take some steps. I'm pretty confident that this is going to work okay, or at least as I say, better than the ones that I've built in the past. This project is going to be open source. I haven't published the CAD and code yet because I don't recommend building it in its current form, at least till I've tested it. And then you probably want to know if it works before you go and build it. And ultimately the CAD and code is published for inspiration in other projects. But if you want to support me on Patreon or for a YouTube channel membership, then you can, and those links are in the description below. All right, that's all for now.